here, move in the middle of the room, and then I'll go to the wings. So bear with us so you can get a microphone so that we have a virtual audience so you can be heard. Is, if is it on? It is. Yeah, okay. Um, my name's David White. I'm, I'm a journalist. Could I bring you back to where you were talking about the challenges and particularly the misuse <laughs> of transfer pricing and other means of tax avoidance, as well as the mismatch between the skills that companies such as oil majors can marshal um, in their effort to pay as little tax as possible and the skills that tax authorities have in order to make them pay as much tax as possible. I mean, this is very much a subject at the moment. Um, Glencore, which is one of those companies which um, up to now existed pretty much outside the glare of publicity, uh, brought itself into the glare of publicity and uh, in, in Zambia uh, the case arose of how much how much tax it was paying there and whether this was um, on um, based on any any real figures um, it, it's, a, it's a problem that all um, countries face not only developing countries but especially developing countries uh, I'm just wondering what kind of strategy you foresee for tackling this, because African countries unilaterally can't do very much. African multilateral, multilateral institutions are relatively weak. You may get some support from people like the OECD, but apparently not much from agencies like the IMF, and certainly not from the accounting profession. I'm just wondering what you plan to do about it. Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, the name's Ewan Grant. I'm a tax and customs consultant who's worked with the Tanzania, Tanzania Revenue Authority a couple of years ago, and uh, I remember seeing some very interesting letters from the Commissioner General. Um, <laughs> and thank you, thank you very much <laughs> for those. You're mm. hitting the nail on mm. many important heads. My question is, is really... Um, a follow-on in a way um, to Mr. White's. It, it, I was going to ask, um, noting the comments about the, import the greater importance of agriculture for employment and development, um, what kind of thinking of grabbing the oil fields and the companies as a way of a sort of preemptive strike about how you and your partner agencies in Uganda and in the region working with um, international agencies, ma major Western countries, about how the, the weaknesses in revenue collection, directly and indirectly, <coughs> in relation to the extra extractive industries, can be pointed out. Maybe perhaps a naming and a shaming but with an agreed um, self-interest agenda before that. I, I would just also finish off by adding that, um, as we've seen in the case of ENRC and so on, I think um, the development community and several African countries could perhaps do more because they've, they've not had a good response from Western countries in that a lot of this stretches into what, quite frankly, is organized criminality and the characteristic policeman's view that this is all wholly diverse from organized criminality mm. um, isn't actually true. Mm. Um, so naming and shaming and getting something in beforehand. Great, Thank thanks. Can we mm -hmm. pass the microphone back? Mm. Thank you. Behind you. Thanks. Uh, Sam Hickey, University of Manchester. Uh, a couple of questions to Alan. Um, uh, thanks for that update on the tax reforms. I wonder if you could just tell us a bit about what's happened in terms of two of the features that were behind the failure of the earlier reforms um, were really about uh, declining presidential support for the reforms and in sort of increasing politicisation of appointments within URA. Could you say a bit about how those have played out and what implication those factors hold for the future of these reforms continuing to do well because the earlier phase of reform started off well and then declined um, and secondly just the issue the routes out of aid dependence that have been mentioned across the panel um, some China 
uh, natural resources and so on. These are big issues in Uganda, clearly. But they have quite contradictory implications for things like government accountability um, and potentially for domestic revenue mobilisation. So could you say a bit more about what you expect to see happening once oil comes properly on stream uh, with regards to domestic revenue mobilisation? Thank you. My name is Jackie and I'm a student from Uganda. I'm at the London School of Economics and I must say that I've, I'm really proud of you and the URA and what we've been hearing. Thank you. Yeah. And just one question I, w I have to ask is about the link between tax and services to the people because I know when you collect tax you don't have a lot of say or you, you know. But many times there's a lot of informal sector in Uganda and many people I know evade tax because they don't see what they will benefit. Mm -hmm. I know we have universal primary education or some medical care but mo it's not uh, up to scratch so many times the citizens are on their own basically so many people don't pay tax because they don't see what the money will do so I don't know if the URA has any agenda of how to influence that. Thank you. I'm going to bring others in in a moment. I'm going to give you a chance, Alan, and also if there's anything in there that Jonathan and, and Mick want to pick up. Would you All like right. to pick up a few of them? Yes. Um, okay, let me just pick up a few and, and just really give point answers. Uh, the challenges we are experiencing in domestic resource mobilization and the strategies that we have in place. Um, it is true we're working very closely with the OECD. Uh, in the areas of capacity building, especially in transfer pricing, we're using the guidelines developed by the OECD. Uh, but the major focus right now is under the forum called um, African Tax Administration Forum. It's a, a new body that about <coughs> two years old that was put together to help African countries help themselves, you know, build capacity, expose. Uh, exchange uh, uh, information and and so there's a lot of work that is happening under the ATAF. Uh, ATAF is also supported by the OECD and, 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 and other development partners but we've, we've seen that um, when we worked together with um, say South Africa uh, because our experiences are similar or with Kenya or with uh, Algeria, mm. we're better able to understand the, the, the challenges we encounter and build capacity internally and also exchange stuff. So ATAF is, 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 is a strong forum and, and that's helping quite a lot. Um, but also we do a lot of training. You know, the, the, the basically we have to build capacity and, and each tax administration must have a strong training institute because I forgot to tell you, we are, the other challenge is that we're losing a lot of stuff to the private sector, strangely, you know, <laughs> from government to the private sector uh, because of this amount of training. But you must have a, a program that is as, as fast as you're losing them, you're generating them through your, through your training institution. Uh, and so those, those challenges are our focus. And every year, every year we go through a process as the East African community and as Uganda Revenue Authority where we look at where are the challenges in domestic resource mobilization? And they make we, we make the solutions in the plan for the next um, in the next financial year. So that's that's how we're addressing um, some of the strategies. In the oil area, um, all industries are big, uh, some bigger than entire na nations, and so they wield a lot of power. They have huge influence in uh, uh, what kind of uh, help and assistance that we get and uh, are able to access uh, technologies that, or, or even um, the best of stuff that we, we don't have. And so you name and shame them, so what? Because wh they, they're not only in Uganda, they're, they're all over the world, they're doing. <coughs> name and shame with others. Oh, okay. <laughs> as, a, as a collective. Uh, uh, okay. N now, that would require an agreement, a, 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 the countries agreeing we're all going to do this together. So you don't get that little Uganda saying company so-and-so has been misbehaving here and, and a, a developed country not doing anything about it. In fact, that is one of the challenges. Uh, not in naming and shaming, but in accessing information on some of these mm. uh, companies. 
I s- that would help us a lot. But I think related to that would be intensive training in uh, oil taxation and especially focusing in the, in the legal frameworks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, be- because when, when you go to court or you go to arbitration, you must have the same capacity in arguing over a matter. Um, I'm not sure I've answered your question, but perhaps we can explore that later. Now, the question that came from um, the gentleman at the back on uh, the update on tax reforms and, and why earlier reforms didn't necessarily succeed, I think it was the design, basically. I, I, I think um, uh, to design a, a program, you must understand we must have in-depth understanding of what the problem is. Now, w- in the last two programs, what happened was uh, the Uganda government needed to raise money and the Uganda government was not happy with the tax administration and the Uganda government commissioned, um, uh, uh, asked the IMF, I think in the first one, I can't remember who did the second one, to do a diagnostic. A two-week diagnostic is not going to tell you what the problem is in Uganda. There are intricacies, there are cultural issues, there are, there are compliance issues. There are, there's a whole lot of things that cause revenue not to grow. The best people in, the people in position to do this are actually the locals. The tax administration who encounter these challenges day after day. So the diagnostics were done, the solutions were designed, the money was given, the expatriates came, they spent there two, three years. Some benefit, but didn't last very long. So th- this time, what we did was to, to scan the, tax, the, 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 the business environment and say, what have we encountered as challenges over the last 14 years? What would we actually like Uganda Revenue Authority to look like? What would the taxpayer like what kind of service would they like? And because when we design it, we own it. Mm. If you design it, well, we might implement <laughs> it, but how long is it going to last? Because I must stay behind and sustain it after the program has ended. So I think it was in the ownership of the program that has made this successful that, didn't, that the others really, the, the, successful wasn't, the success wasn't tangible. The benefits weren't tangible. Uh, I think there was a related question in how are we going to manage the oil, mm-hmm. the oil revenues. Uh, we are putting in, th- the, the way we are designing the management of the revenue is to create a sovereign fund so that this money is not wholesale going to go into uh, alleviating the, the budget uh, shortfalls and, and building roads and you know having white elephants all over the place because that's Typically, that's what happened in a number of countries a few years ago. So the money will be invested probably in uh, outside the country, in financial markets, in property markets, elsewhere, out, out of the country. The returns, a portion of the returns, will then fund energy, because an energy fund has been created. That's the biggest problem, like I said earlier. And the roads and key sectors uh, in the economy, so a sovereign fund has been created, is being created. And the Revenue Authority URA is still going to be collecting the money, but it goes to a completely Mm. separate account. So it doesn't go to the consolidated fund. Um, Just one quick one, and then we'll go out for some more. I think there was a link between tax and services. (coughs) The lady, Diana, did you say Diana? Yeah. Yes. (laughs) Uh, we, when we began to do the reforms and we were hitting our targets and getting surpluses, the question that then came to the pub from the public was, you're reporting all these successes, but we don't see the services. Now, it is not correct that the, m- the services were not being offered, but there was no communication. Government is not good at communicating. Mm. Uh, uh, the spokespeople for government don't explain to the public what the money has done. So the minister every year reads her budget speech, the lady, and she says of the so much collected, this is what we have done over so many roads, so many dams, so many things. (coughs) But to the man um, 
in the village. That's not their concern. So the, the arm of government that should go to the people and say, we will reach this area in five years is not speaking. And so you feel th there's a lot of dissatisfaction. Having realized that Revenue Authority has asked permission from our minister to do that job, because we are, we are spread all over the country. We are the ones collecting the money. So we have designed a program where we now address, where we tell the citizens what the money does and say, you may not see your road in, 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 uh, done in five years because a major road is being done um, to evacuate exports, for example. Mm. So th that's what we're going to do. OK, very good. Communication is key. Miles, can we get a mic down here? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Miles Wick said um, three quick points, if I may, um, other than thanking Jonathan for his positive um, uh, reference to the Commission for Africa <laughs> report. Um, uh, point one, the Select Committee, uh, the International Development Select Committee, is about to start an inquiry on the issue of taxation. I think some of the debate and discussion here will be very useful for that. Mm -hmm. And, I, and uh, your predecessor, Alison, as you know, and I are advisors to the committee. We will make sure some of this is, debate is, is reflected in, that, uh, in the, their terms of reference. Uh, second point on, on oil companies. Uh, my understanding is that in Uganda, a, a good deal of the problem is not so much the taxation regime. It's the fact that um, really bad agreements were signed in the 1990s and that you're bound by those agreements and it's trying to find a way of, of, of getting better agreements that is the real problem actually rather than taxation. It'd be very interesting for you to say what you can about, uh, about <laughs> that. Uh, and, and the third point I want to make is that you know, all of us in the development community were very fond of saying that the best investment you can possibly make in development is girls' education. I wonder if you would on the panel agree that actually perhaps the best investment you could make is in tax because the figure that I trot out, I don't know if it's, if it's right, but tell me if it is or not, is that for every dollar that is invested in improvement of tax systems, you get a $10 return, which seems to me a pretty good yeah, rate of return. That is Thank you. Yeah, that's that's right. um, next to you, um, Mars, Andrew. Before, sorry, I yeah, sorry, Andrew. Sorry, before I get Andrew to, I just want to read out um, uh, from one of our virtual viewers, uh, there is a question. This is from Joe Powell, who works for the One Campaign, um, based here in London. Um, he says, on, on extractive transparency, it follows up for your point, it's now legally binding for oil, gas, and mining companies in the US to publish what they pay the governments of the countries in which they operate. And soon, Europe will have the same legislation. Mm. This transparency will mean a company like Tallow, Tallow Oil, which is a big... Uh, uh, exp exp exploratory <laughs> company in, in Uganda will be publishing all their payments, including tax, to the government of Uganda. Mm -hmm. What impact do you think this might have in terms of effective use of domestic resources? <laughs> I suppose you just go, yay. Yeah. But <laughs> over to you, Andrew. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. It's, it's great to hear this, um, this good news story. Um, obviously, Uganda with oil can reduce aid dependence faster than Uganda without oil. But I'd like you to speculate in a way for the benefit of countries which don't have oil. And based on your experience, long experience now, um, heading the tax administration, on where you, if Uganda did not have oil, where Uganda would be going with tax over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Clearly, there are uh, growing expectations, big demands, universal secondary education, social protection, and so on and so forth in terms of public expenditure. So I just wanted you to speculate on mm -hmm. that. Okay. At the back there, the gentleman with the pink shirt. Uh, my name's uh, Thomas. I used to head up Bloomberg Finance for Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and then worked for Reuters, but I'm s currently semi-retired. But I've actually been to Sierra Leone, Malawi, and South Africa in various capacities f uh, for charities, microfinance, uh, consultancy in Malawi, and AIDS development in South Africa. Um, as a finance person, you know, I'll put my hand up straight away and say that I am. What, what really is disappointing is you know, that in Africa, the, the concept of balance sheet, cash flows, basic accounting is extremely lacking. When you, tr you know, I've tried to help a few businesses 
entrepreneurs, it seems extremely lacking. I don't know how you can get around that. that that's the first point. Second point is also, um, I've got shares actually, one or two oil companies, and I, I'm really surprised about the dispute going on about payments, but, but that aside. But the thing that really surprises me, which really hasn't come up here, I think there's some double standards, because you've got China in Africa, and I think there's one rule for the Europeans, and there's one rule for China, and that China seems to be going in and really getting a, you know, a lot of things for not the right reasons. And I, I think you know, that's going to be an issue go going forward. And, and I think the last point is, you know, I think uh, that I'd agree with one or two colleagues here who say, you know, let's invest in the tax administration because that's how you, you can generate the revenue. And actually, what about VAT enforcing it? Okay, Thank thanks you. very much. Over to you, to Andy. I'll come back. Thanks, uh, Andy Norton, Research Director at ODI. I just um, a quick note on this thing about productive sectors. Um, when the donors originally swung in on a big scale behind social service delivery, it was actually a growth analysis that originally drove that of the East Asian miracle and the sense that sort of broad-based human capital development had been important in the growth story in East Asia. Um, 20 years on, um, seeing, you know, as many people have said, healthier growth rates in a lot of Africa country, African countries, it's, it would be interesting to revisit that. But it's just a question about the, what is a productive sector? Because it wasn't initially driven by a poverty analysis, it was driven by a growth analysis. I'm going to take three really quick ones and then I want to come back to the panel. Gentlemen here at the back and then the guy over there. Just here, Mark. You're doing a great job. We need about four of you, really, don't we? <laughs> Uh, I'm Matthew Benson. I'm a student at the IDS, um, doing research on taxation. Um, one question I had was just oh, you, yeah. sorry. One question I had was just looking at um, the politics or discussion around taxation. How has it really changed? I mean, I was recently in the Entebbe airport, and one of the first signs you see is sort of "Pay your taxes. It's good for the country." These sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Has there been a change around voting issues and these sorts of things in, um, in since since you've been there and since major changes have been made? Mm. Okay. Gentleman at the back with the check. Hi, I'm Chris Jordan from ActionAid. Um, a couple of years back, the OECD estimated that developing countries lose more to tax, sorry, three times more to tax havens than they receive in aid every year. Um, and lots of this is money that individuals and companies are avoiding and evading. Is this something that aid donors in the rich world should be uh, doing more on, and, and perhaps particularly at the G20 this year? Colin Smith, former World Bank staff member, and I've worked in Uganda quite extensively. Um, to what extent did your decentralization process in, from memory in the 90s affect your organization? And have you devolved taxation? Uh, because in the rural development areas, the, it's the local governments which are, seem to be really hard up to support the, the people in their area. Well, I'd like to take on uh, um, this issue of uh, emerging actors in China. I think it, I, I, I personally think it's absolutely crucial. With, with regard to aid, aid is nowhere near as much uh, with the newish emerging donors, mostly from the East, but also in Brazil, as it is from traditional donors. But it's growing quite substantially. What is found in this interesting debate between social mm -hmm. sectors and infrastructure investment uh, is, that, is that China, classically, but also other donors, focus much more of their money on infrastructure, whereas the traditional donors, for the last 10 years at least, have been focusing much more on social sectors. So there's an element of, of complementarity there. I agree that there are risks, by the way, with regard to accounting and transparency, and uh, something that traditional donors focus on quite substantially, uh, that China uh, doesn't focus on as much. Ha nevertheless, the broad impact of the rise of, 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 of different powers, I see as incredibly um, important for Africa, and that's the general thing, that, and that's the, that's the general sentiment on the African continent, except for people who feel like they're not getting jobs out of it, and that, I think, is one of the many risks. But the general sentiment of governments and civil servants is th the arrival of the Chinese is exceptionally good news. 
I think it's linked to aid dependence, and I'd like to just use this, um, uh, suggest that we look at Latin America. It's talked about how do you get the most out of oil uh, revenues and uh, general big business. Yes, they're powerful, and actually, historically, they've had very, very powerful friends. Now, what happens when you reduce the amount of dependence you have on those powerful friends? You can implement policies that previously were basically off limits. Um, things like infant industry um, support, something that President Obama has talked about, capital controls, something the IMF is talking about, industrial policy you can't laugh at anymore when you've got China um, striding the world stage, import <coughs> substitution, anathema, was something that the Colombian ambassador, a neoliberal economist, mentioned himself at this very table a month ago. I'm not saying any of these are good or bad. Uh, what I'm saying is it's incredibly good that these things are being talked <coughs> about, and I think that those kind of options are, are available to countries in a way that they weren't before, and I, I, I think that's what means that I think there's a new era which means that African countries are more likely to be able to convert the opportunities into um, development benefits. Um, uh, and, and finally, I, I'd make my pitch. I think, it is, it, I, I, I think it's a bit too easy to say you should invest in tax because it has this return, because you know, does that mean we pull out of investing in education, as Andy said? Does it pull out of the, the desperately urgent health investments? I'm afraid it's just not obvious. And I would add uh, something to the list, which is investment in private sector development. But, uh, but by that, I mean SME development. Someone asked, how do we improve accounting? Well, it's just how, yeah, how do you improve capacity of small, medium-sized, and sometimes uh, very small private businesses? And it just takes time. But you have to invest in financial services. Not and, and banks have to invest in small and medium-sized enterprises, just like they do in the UK, actually, rather than the obvious wins, which are the big companies. How does one do that? Well, it takes political leadership. Thank you. Um, yes, Miles, your question. Should aid donors be investing in uh, revenue mobilization? Yes, but yes, but. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's a very important but here. Um, I think the aid donors actually have quite a good record of uh, supporting tax administration, partly because there's been a very small number. There's really only been four big players in Africa, which is the IMF, the World Bank, DFID, and GTZ. Mm -hmm. And they've been pretty well coordinated. What we have now, you know, the aid business, as we know, is driven by all kinds of herd behaviors. And we get this, 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 mm -hmm. and go from <laughs> one extreme to the other. And very recently, you know, tax has suddenly become the very attractive subject. And some people are worried, and I think rightly, that all kinds of aid donors are going to be sort of, you know, giving Alan brown envelopes of, um, not brown envelopes, it'll be official. <laughs> but, um, you know, there'll be little bits of money, and, you know, unless well handled, that could actually mm. be very problematic. That's we get so all the traditional important. problems of, you know, what well, we want to send our consultants as well. So, first place, this needs to be well coordinated and pretty well centralized, otherwise it's going to be dangerous. But secondly, let's just look in terms of volumes. You know, Alan gave us some figures. Maybe 2% of aid goes to, re to uh, revenue administration, probably much less. You can double that without impacting at all significantly on anything else that Jonathan talked about, and it might be too much. You know, I mean, if you double aid to any sector very quickly, it could be a problem. So we're not actually talking about a big issue here. I and mean, we think we're actually talking about a, quite a small issue. Yes. Um, uh, just one on the oil companies. Um, yes, it's true that in the 1990s when these um, production sharing agreements were made, uh, there was there wasn't enough uh, local capacity to engage in the negotiations with the oil companies. Fortunately, <coughs> a number of those SP, uh, PSAs are now coming to an end, and there's going to be a new licensing round. So there's opportunity now to have uh, you know, input into making good um, uh, production sharing agreements. Um, in fact, the, the, the case we have with Heritage and Talo is around uh, not the taxation of the of the product of oil, but of the, oil, the, the interpretation of the production sharing agreements. Mm. Um, where would we be without oil? Um, the, 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 the projection for growth in tax to GDP ratio annually is supposed to be 0.5%, but it's actually been going at 0 0.3. This year, the projection is uh, zero p next financial year beginning in July, 0.45%. So in the next 10 years, if we are at 13% uh, 
12.9% now, uh, in 10 years maybe uh, we would expect to see a growth of about 5%. So we're talking about 18%. If there are no shocks, if, if there are no revenue reducing measures, and if the GDP continues to grow, because the economy, the Ugandan economy is, is doing very well. You know, it's, it's uh, I think the lowest we went even during the financial crisis was 5% five five percent growth, uh, but it's growing 6, 7, and, and this year is projected, uh, I believe, 9. So uh, eb uh, all things being equal, uh, we expect to see 18%. But I have to say that... Um, that's I that's mathematics, you know. Uh, the reality is is, is different. Um, a really good question, I think, that uh, came from the gentleman. We we need to define the what is the product production, the productive sector, because in some cases, indeed, it is the social sector. In others, it is industry. In others, it is tax administration. So mm -hmm. every country must define what is the best rate of return uh, for aid. And and um, and I think I, th I wanted to perhaps speak out. Um, there was a question. Yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to ask, which mm. comes back to this sort of one rule for China, one rule for, for Europe. I mean, that, that's quite a challenging question to you. In I don't actually understand the question. Could you I think find that, that for me? I think there's a sense in which maybe uh, particularly companies, mm. and, you know, foreign direct investors from Europe are being held to higher standards by, uh, by recipients than China, who is pretty much allowed to do its own thing on the grounds that it's a different relationship. Um, I have no capacity whatsoever <laughs> to... <laughs> I don't think I have enough knowledge to, to answer that question. It would actually be an interesting question mm -hmm. to follow through on um, uh, what standard of accountability are you demanding from... Uh, but from a taxation point of view, you see no difference? Absolutely none. Okay. Yeah, yeah. maybe you redefine... Sorry, they sold, uranium. Sorry, they sold mm. uranium to China mm. for a new parliament, some infrastructure, etc. Mm. And, you know, think of the, the, gro you know, the value of uranium and the tax you could have had, mm. and yet it seems to have been bypassed. Yeah. That's my understanding. Okay, so let, let me just end with um, the issue on, on uh, coordination of donors, which I think mm -hmm. is so critical that Mick talked about. I had an experience when we began these reforms and we began to see the results and, and you know, we could see that th 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 we're getting more revenue as a result of the reforms. There's a lot of interest from other development partners to come and begin to support Uganda Revenue Authority. And uh, some would come directly to me, some would go through the Ministry of Finance, would say, okay, we have money for you. And I'd say, hang on, you know, I have a program running. I cannot be designing another one because the money has become available. It's going to interrupt the process. But often you do get uh, a lot of help, uh, well-meaning help, but that can become a problem because you have not planned it properly. And because perhaps the donor wants you to ad address a, a pet area, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. the, the pet area in, 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 in Africa currently is one-stop border. Everybody wants to do one-stop border. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how much help can I get in one-stop border? Could you, could you look at this? And in fact, about two years ago, I said, thank you, but no thanks, you know, because this, this, this is too much. <laughs> I can't handle this at this time. So coordination is so important. <coughs> to get the, you know, <coughs> quick benefit. Last point I want to make, and perhaps this is to us in Africa and, and uh, also to uh, the, the developed country. If aid was a finite resource, just like oil, would we have better plans? Would we use it better? Would we invest for the future using the, this amount of money? Mm -hmm. an interesting thought. Um, Mick, you'd like a, a, a little addition, so I'm going to give it to you. One Although sentence. I would like Alan to have the last word. I okay. so. She'll, she'll agree with me. I <laughs> Alan, you will agree with me. If Britain wants to help people like you raising more revenue in Uganda or elsewhere in Africa, giving more money is much less important than, for example, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs cooperating much more with you on information exchange and many other things. Is that right? <laughs> that is so absolutely right. In <laughs> fact, <laughs> <laughs> and, and in fact, um, I, I think 
if we had if we if there was a global agreement we could sign to access information that would release revenue uh, there was a, a, a question on um, tax havens and uh, what what are we doing about it we're, we're building capacity we're, uh, we're looking at that the double taxation agreements that are signed with the, with the different countries and how their information is made available um, I'm trying to see if there's anybody from Mauritius, but we're having a problem <laughs> with companies are flocking to Mauritius, oil companies, because oil is discovered in Uganda now, everybody's registered in Mauritius. And we have a double taxation agreement mm. and we're, we're saying we must review this thing, there's, there's some, uh, something there. So um, information exchange is so critical. And, 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 and as long as um, development, develop, developed countries don't feel the need to share information with us, we are going to get stuck in, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this problem. We cannot develop, we cannot mobilize our own resources because it's the same companies that are coming from these countries. So the next big global campaign maybe needs to be a global campaign for tax administrations to talk to one another more mm -hmm. effectively. That's a neat uh, campaigning message for the end. Mm -hmm. I think this has been absolutely terrific. I think you and your colleagues uh, in revenue authorities around Africa are true pioneers, and we, I think, all support and are, uh, all your efforts and are delighted that you had the opportunity to come through and share some of your mm -hmm. thoughts. Thank you very much to Jonathan mm -hmm. and to Mick, too, for the initial suggestion. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.